Welcome back everybody to your daily update on what will soon be the Malazan Empire. <clears throat> and today we're here to talk about the next parts of Kalanvet's Reach, those being chapters um, 6 to 11, I think. And it all continues apace, which I <laughs> should never make any promises, right? Um, and we're going to do the next 5 or 6 chapters tomorrow and the rest on Thursday. And then we have Friday for something, and I don't know what it will be. Possibly Inhibitor Phase by Alistair Reynolds, because I'm currently reading that on the side. Um, also other stuff, so we'll see how that goes. Um, if you're interested in the Inhibitor Phase thing, then let me know. Um, otherwise, well, I'll probably still do it, because, you know. Anyway, <laughs> that's kind of where we are right now, so I guess we should start talking Calumbet's Reach again. Cheers. Now, if you remember, we left everyone doing their thing, preparing the attack on Nap, and um, while Dancer and Kellenved had their disappointment at the valley of uh, tools, bones, or whatever you want to call it, when they found a shitload of Emas um, tools and sl other flint stuff, and nothing else. So that's kind of where we start today with um, all kinds of things, like preparations for the invasion of Nap. And this is where we'll end today. That part of the story will be the um, taking over of the Napan Isles. Um, but before we go out there, we also get a lot of other things. One of them is... Um, Heboric doing his trip to the Isle of Poliel and meeting a goddess. Now there's a bunch of interesting things about that that I want to, you know, mention. Well, first of all, obviously the idea of a saint of whatever, um, or a, a, a devout person, I should say, a devout or spiritually powerful person meeting a god and only recognizing that they meet a god after a while um, is, you know, a figure that we've seen in mythology a bunch of times, whether it is in Christian mythology with your saints and whatnot, your, um, I don't know, Saint Christophorus. Is Christophorus the, the guy who, um, I think it's Christophorus who's carrying some like, through rivers and shit like that, you know, um, we have seen that a lot in in all kinds of mythologies. It's, I mean, Greek and Rome gods <laughs> regularly showed up and just talked to uh, people, apparently, or, or raped them, and that's, you know, only for the really big ones, apparently. Um, um, so, you know, it's nice to have that in the Malazan world, the same kind of figure going on there. Um, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about here. Uh, what I wanted to talk about, there's like two things. One of them is um, potentially spoilery because we, we learn of that plague here that's going on, that was going on at the beginning of um, Dead House Landing that drove um, Dasem and uh, Nara out of um, Li Hang, all of that. Um, we learn that it is not of um, Poliel's origin, which is interesting, because she's the goddess of plague and sickness. It's of someone else, and it's supposed to be a first demonstration of power. Now, what could that possibly be, I wonder, and who could that possibly be? Well, I'm not going to say anything, I just figured it's a nice prefigurement for events in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, so that's just cool. But the other thing that I wanted to look at um, is a short discussion that Heboric has with Poliel um, about uh, why she is sometimes, um, you know, how she, how Poliel, well, she do, he doesn't know that she's Poliel at the point. Like, um, the idea that she is shocked and disgusted by the fact that um, even though she is um, obviously a plague carrier or a, a sick person, that there are people that are interested in um, having sex with her and uh, because they think it might um, cure or make them immune, immune. And they talk about the whole thing that the same thing happens with um, 
people believing that uh, sleeping with virgins would cure or make uh, certain illnesses or make people younger and whatnot. And this is, a, I mean, this is like a really interesting aspect because there's people that have talked about it with the Malazan Book of the Fallen. <laughs> Ruth and Bud have spoken about it with uh, the Bidithal thing and female genital mutilation. And um, there's other parts in the Malazan Book of the Fallen where we have things like that happening. And the idea is, yes, they have to be included or they, because they're references to stuff that happens in the real world. And um, that happened in the real world right now. And so far, I mean, you know, there's like general trends, obviously, all the time, because the world building of the Malazan world by Esselmund and Ericsson is obviously based on their experiences as anthropologists and uh, archaeologists. So that makes a lot of sense. But like specific things, at least in Path to Ascendancy, not so much up to now. But this one, it struck home because I because I recently read like an article about it, but that's something that you still have a lot of ideas um, in um, parts of the planet when it comes to, for example, curing AIDS or being immune to AIDS, that people think um, that, um, yes, having sex with a virgin might make you immune to contracting uh, the HIV, the HIV uh, virus, or... Um, possibly cure it. We don't need to talk about how terribly, how terrible that kind of superstition is. And I'm pretty sure it also exists for other sicknesses, other um, illnesses. So, yeah. And having a situation where the goddess of disease is appalled by people believing that, um, I feel, is one of those situations where the Malazan world comments um, on our world and things that happen in on our in our world. So I just wanted to, you know, just point that out because I found it, you know, it's one of those things where people are, for whatever reasons, always uh, praising um, the writings of Steven Erickson and kind of dismissing the writings of Ian Asselman, and I feel that's unfair. And, you know, this is one of those situations where I feel see er er Asselman does the same thing. He may just be a bit more subtle about it in some situations or choose different paths, but there's like a similar intention there or like the, the connections to the real world and these not being escapist, uh, escapist fantasy in the purest sense, but also very much about um, our world and our actions in our world, you know, is just as present here as in other in, uh, in Stephen Erickson's writings, so yeah, n just a nice, you know, small bit here at the beginning. But anyway, Polio sends Heboric off to Li Hang. So we're gonna see the first signs, I mean, it was kind of mentioned before, when uh, Kellenved kind of hinted at it, that he is not finished with Li Hang, but the idea is that maybe we'll see where this trilogy, the... Um, Path to Ascendancy trilogy will end. Um, that is where it started. You know, the whole idea that a lot of uh, Malazan writing, especially Stephen Erickson's, but possibly also um, Cam Esselman's writing, um, is circular or elliptical in nature. And when we started Dance's Lament, we started in Li Hang with, um, or outside of Li Hang, with a reference to the Army of Bone, or that first. Um, um, how to say, um, not the first spearhead, and it seems to be the case that we are heading towards that Li Hang again, or at least the narrative is heading there. So we have that um, once again showing up um, with uh, Heboric going towards Li Hang, uh, Kellenvet mentioning Li Hang again, so we'll see how that all turns out um, in the rest, like I mean, the other half of the novel that is still before us. All right. Now the next big thing I feel, another one that I find um, interesting, is the um, combat scenes with Gregor and uh, the Blurians and the Grisians. Oh, technically also with um, Origin Greymane um, and the Persians against the Quantalis, but mostly 
from what we spoke about yesterday, the way that um, um, pressed into service um, foot groups are used in what you might call your typical medieval um, <coughs> combat, because we actually get a fairly um, clear depiction of such a battle, which is interesting because every kind of battle we see in the Malazan Book of the Fallen and more or less in the novels of the Malazan Empire, every larger engagement is already on those. Either older or newer, depending on what you want to call it, um, um, uh, doctrine of warfare, that being the um, the Legion doctrine of either the Quantalian, uh, the Italian Iron Legion, or the Malazan Legion, what will come later on with, you know, the Marines and what have you. Um, whereas this is your typical, like, feudal scrap where you have your um, nobility just hacking it out, killing their own soldiers by accident, but when they run around on their big war horses, <coughs> doing all that shit. Um, so having a fairly accurate or on the ground description of the ridiculousness of that is, I feel, important. Because once again, it will make clear why um, or explain why and how the Malazan Empire could rise to power so um, um, quickly later on, just by simply um, taking advantage of all those um, small time squabbles between all those small time um, duchies, kingdoms and what have you. And also by adopting a different military doctrine that um, can, as uh, Dasem explains to Dancer, I feel, um, you know, work very well. And it's like, yeah, well, well-trained, a well-trained infantry legion is totally capable of taking part cavalry, especially the heavy cavalry that we have here. I mean, this is not like the, the, the what we see here on Quantali is not your... Um, what you see with, like, the Wiccans or Seti, or in our world would be uh, all kinds of, like, light cavalry troops, well, with, like, you know, your Mongolian horde, like, I don't want to say horde, it sounds terrible, uh, your Mongolian troops or what have you, when you have, like, a very light mobile car cavalry, that's mostly mobile archers. But that's not what we have here. What we have here is heavily armored um, knights that... Um, need a lot of support troops and a lot of support train to just be able to be there. And while one of those can totally, as we see, run into a, a undisciplined mob of people and just crush everyone. Because if you've ever seen, like, a large horse, if you've ever seen, like, what even, like, our trained police horses can do, yeah, you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to encounter an actual, like, battle, like, war horse. And if you have, like, an actual, like, a, a rider on top of him and all that horse that knows what they're doing. Well armored, hard to, hard to get rid of. Like, the only thing you can do is basically take down the horse or unhorse them, because as long as they're up there, they're basically invincible. And one of the things that I found super fascinating about that battle is that those war warriors are, like, knights, well armored, the whole nine yards. But what they're doing is, um, what they, the, when we see what weapons they have, they're not your typical, oh, they're wielding swords because they're warriors, they're, they're knights. No, they're using war axes and maces and um, war picks. And I, I love the fact that there's like, they actually use war picks. All those wonderful um, pole arms that <laughs> you see so much in your D&D &D, um, weapons manual stuff. Um, because, yeah, if you're on top of a horse, you want reach, and the sword doesn't really provide that. So having something like a mace, but longer, and just like hit, where just the hit with a blunt aim does already a lot of damage. Or an axe, or a pick, or a, yeah, all of those things. Makes a lot more sense, because you basically, you know, <laughs> that's how your warfare works. You, you ride towards the other fellow, and then you try to hit him somewhere, and ideally they fall off their horse, and that's all you can do. So having that battle described in a lot of detail, I felt was um, just really helpful. Not, well, not helpful, but just really um, interesting to see, uh, to, you, to, to contrast what will come later on, in a way. 
and explain the rise of the Malazan military. The other thing that we obviously learn here is once again in detail like that clear class divide and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the other thing obviously with Origin later to become um, Greymane and his warfare is also um, the idea of not playing by specific rules and uh, thus um, wrong-footing the enemy and being way more successful, which he does by first like orchestrating that ambush, then just not actually committing but going to a counter-offensive and hurting the Quantali alliance um, where it hurts them the most, which is by taking out their economy. Um, we're going to talk about that in a minute as well. The other interesting... Um, thing here that I feel is important to look at with all these jumps between all these different groups. What we, what we also see here is that this continuous like small scale warfare between all these small kingdoms there leads to a like is the reason why we have so many really extremely talented and uh, capable military figures later on in the Malaz world because <clears throat> there's so much room for them to train you have your like gray mane you have your um crimson guard which is your typical elitist um, asshole <laughs> mercenary group at this point at least um you have your um like well we have your gregor who i assume will become blues i have no idea we'll see um, we, you have all these people because everyone is brawling all the time. So of course you have like a breeding ground for a lot of like great military minds that will show up on all sides of the conflict in the Malaz world. This this is sort of where they are all trained and um, well, not technically not all trained, but where they kind of get created just by the circumstances. So I feel that's that's one of the reasons why we have all these small time wars in this book that feel almost like they're a bit too <clears throat> much because this is like a lot of the people we meet here right now are not exactly people that we meet in the you know in the Malazan Empire especially the Crimson Guard dudes right that's that's sort of not their point but what we see here is where the the overall picture comes how the overall picture comes together that is the basis for both the novels of the Malazan Empire and the Malazan Book of the Fallen which is why we have this chaotic mess of a of a world today in, in, in Kellenvet's reach with all these different squabbles all over the place. Whereas there is that bigger thing rising in the background slowly. All right, what else to talk about? Um, the idea of um, capitalism. Now, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of capitalism, um, as I guess I have made plain before. <laughs> um, but what I find interesting here is that um, in the Malazan world, we come to situations where we have already kind of progressed beyond what you might call a... Um, your typical medieval, um, um, mostly agrar agrarian society, because you have a lot of trade, you have merchants, you have a merchant class. Now, don't get me wrong, you always had, in even in medieval Europe, and I'm using Europe here because, as I said, like, these like parts and the way it's described in Gris and Blur and Purge and Quantali feels more like medieval Europe than other parts of the Malaz world. Uh, with um, this small jump cut because of camera overheating again, um, we're back to talk about trade in medieval Europe and stuff. <clears throat> so anyway, what I'm trying to say is that um, the um, introduction of a merchant class in mm, specific parts of the world, that being medieval Europe and so forth, took a long time. Um, we're talking about like the 13th, not really the 13th, more like the 14th century, because before that you have like dedicated few people, but then in like the 14th century in Italy, you have the building out of larger trade houses that trade, do general trading. It's kind of when we 
begin to even think about like a banking system or starts the, the, well the first idea of a banking system um, those things bring with itself uh, bring with it a lot of issues that we or like developments that we traditionally don't associate with a medieval fantasy world I mean obviously you get some of that in um, say um, Joe Abercrombie's um, first law trilogy because his world is also way more of a renaissance world without firearms than anything typical medieval which you know makes a lot of sense but the fact that we have that here is also is indicative that the Malazan world is not just a an agrarian world which brings with it some aspects of um, an economical system that are important that being your cliched rich merchant who gets even richer off the backs of everyone else your basic issue with capitalism and we, what we learn here is that with Quantali it's very much that Quan being the economic center of that league has basically the uh, leverage to um, dictate what the Talian soldiers will do, which means that we have reached that point where the economic power is, as a matter of fact, larger than the military power, or what you might call your classic nobility, which means your nobility either starts to also get into finance and trade, or will probably lose power in that internal power struggle, which once again, is one of the things that we'll see play a role later on in the Malazan Empire, where we have a very distinct um, approach to <laughs> towards the nob nobility, and we'll see why that works. Because what happens with the um, establishment of like merchant houses um, and you know, city-dwelling burghers, basically, what you might call burghers, and the establishment of what turns out to become the bourgeoisie, basically, um, is um, that those people, traders, um, craftsmen, what have you, but independent and no longer um, just um, living on a feudal landlord's land, um, they start to establish their own power, and that comes at the cost of the nobility, so there is that um, conflict already existing that later on the Malazan Empire and the Empress in particular, but also the Emperor, will, um, you know, use to build their own, you know, power base by weak, by building on that pressure from the civil population towards the nobility, all the hatred and all the, like, y century-old, basically, um, resentment that has already been established there. So I feel that's an interesting aspect to keep in mind, um, that we have those first excesses of the merchant's class. We have reached a point where um, a um, where the nobility can no longer just, you know, press all that money from the populace um, if they need it, it basically has turned the other way around already. So it's just an interesting aspect to keep in mind, and it's kind of shown here <clears throat> with that whole idea of um, Greymane, who gets his name finally, um, uh, not attacking Tali, but attacking Quan, and forcing the um, merchant, uh, using the merchant class to recall the army from the um, Persian lands. So I just felt that was like an interesting aspect to point out, to kind of show what kind of parallels we'll find here which once again makes sense because that's also the end of like the middle ages like or like the high middle ages is sort of where that whole idea of prancing around on horseback with full armor loses its efficacy which it will soon do as well so that, that all kind of fits in so if you're looking for parallels in the real world then maybe those might be something although what i found fascinating with Quan and tali also was a, a small parallel to the Greek world. Now that I mean like the classical Greek world, which is for a long time that weird combination of the cities of Athens and Sparta, 
And why did I think that? Because the main thing with Athens is it's obviously a trade port. And for a long time, they built their long walls from the city proper down to the harbor. I mean, there's two harbors that appear. Piraeus, uh, which is the one that we now know, that's also the old one, the Phaleron. But they built these long walls to connect the harbor with and with the city proper. And at several points in their history, it's exactly those walls that were neglected or built up or destroyed that kind of clear up that, um, or like, that are the, the, the breaking point for any campaign against Athens is when you take, kind of cut off the city proper with the residential areas from the harbor with all the riches. So that's just like something that I found fast, you know, interesting to see that maybe you can see that inspiration for Quan with the harbor and everything. Anyway, just a small side thing there. Which also kind of makes sense when you have the Italian Iron Legion basically standing at, as what you might call a phalanx. Now, obviously, alliances between Sparta and Athens are far and few between because most of the time they <laughs> used to knock each other senseless in way too many ways. But that's a different story because we're not doing ancient history today, I hope. So, um, what remains to be looked at? <clears throat> the attack on Nap proper which is kind of where the whole thing ends for today, is once it's been carried out, we see for the first time, we see how um, Surly, Lady Surath, is asserting her power, because in the absence of um, Dancer and <coughs> Kellenved, she takes over the planning for the whole attack. She has already infiltrated the entire palace, so all the other stuff that happens around there with the attack, or the dis you know, the distraction that um, Kellen Red is planning, she checks over all those details. And that is important because she asserts her power in that moment when Dancer and Kellen Red are once again off to hunt down those dumb, um, uh, whatever the power to the to the uh, mass army. Um, she basically solves the entire thing with um, her brother. And another really important thing happens there as well, like, that um, that is that she does not t just take over Nap because what we find at the beginning, right, in the beginning of Dead House Landing, it's her trying to come back, uh, defeat her brother, and take over Nap and become the queen of Nap. <coughs> um, but now with Kellenved and all this other stuff, she has already accepted the idea of building an empire. I mean, we've also seen that before in the scene when they are trying to figure out all the ranks for all those different people and come up with the idea of the claws and um, even more the high f the, the fists and the high fists <coughs> instead of the swords, which will be interesting because later on we obviously have Dasem calling himself um, the first sword. Um, but yeah, we already see the idea of an actual empire being like a worldly empire, being at least um, thought of and um, planned by Surly. Which once again raises the question, like, how much of an empire do Kellenved and Dancer actually want? I mean, obviously Dancer said he doesn't want one. Kellenved, whoever knows what that man really wants to do with his life. Um, so yeah, um, that uh, whole scene, it also gives us another depiction of like water like maritime warfare including magics with that mage hyacinth we also get like a first look at the saboteurs or the, the spirit of the saboteurs so that's cool um and then yeah everything comes off like surly planned like they they just you know the mages fuck off somewhere else because the witch jardine you know does her thing with Kellenved or does not, and then they go off and do whatever we'll be talking about tomorrow. Um, and then Surly and her, at this point, still non-magical claws do um, their thing, and she just basically takes out her brother or convinces him to um, go into exile, and they install the <coughs> Council of Elders, whatever you want to call it, Council of Nap, which kind of answers to Surly. 
um, which kind of, I guess, makes Nap the first province of the empire or something like that. So, I guess this is where the this is where the birth of the empire really starts, um, with taking over Nap and not turning it over to Surly, but Surly keeping power over both Malas and Nap and uh, whatever they'll conquer next, I guess. Of course, another thing that we kind of forgot to talk about yesterday is the um, beginning of the Talons as the rival organization to the to the Claws. When they come to the mining camp at the escarpment and <clears throat> there's people that kind of want to follow ta uh, Dancer and he kind of sends them off to make them, in essence, like a secret police or not even a secret, secret police, but a spy organization all over the place that follows, that, you know, is beholden to him as a person. So and this, and this is, I feel, fascinating because what we have here is, <clears throat> overall, we have the talents and that organization beholden to the person of Dancer. No one else. It's very much about the person of Dancer. We have the Clan, which is very much about the person of Surly. They're personal organizations. We see the beginning of something like that forming for Dasa Multor with his self-appointed... Um, bodyguards and whoever will come into that like group that is like personal followers of Dasim Ultor and I guess we'll start seeing something in a similar vein with Teishren and mages because <laughs> as far as that's possible with mages I guess but the interesting thing is Kalanbed does not have such a personal power base he basically relies on everyone, or he probably doesn't care, but he basically relies on everyone else doing what he says if he ever bothers to say anything. Which, you know, is an inter interesting construct for how to, <laughs> how, to <run> a <laughs> how to run a crew, much less a kingdom, <laughs> and even less an empire. So maybe the, the downfall of Kelenved, of the emperor, is already kind of built into the whole structure. We'll have to think more about that um, tomorrow and on Thursday, I guess, when we finish the book. Um, but yeah, that's, I guess, it for today. And uh, I'll uh, talk to you tomorrow about more of it. And until then, cheers.